Today is all about conversion. Saul's, Ananias's, Peter's, and ours. So many ways in which we need to be converted. Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He believed them to be an existential threat to all that he believed, to all that he held to be true, an existential threat to the religious framework that he used to make sense of the world. He believed these things in his bones. And so he went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Jesus had other plans. As Saul approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? Saul, Saul. It takes us back to the garden path on Easter morning. Mary. And something about hearing this voice caught Saul's heart, just like it did Mary's. And just like Mary knew her Rabboni, Saul knew it was the Lord. But he sure needed to know more. Who are you, Lord? Who are you who would come and talk to me? The calling of our name, it has a way of shaking our hearts loose. Jesus replies, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Conversion number one. Jesus is completely and totally aligned with, inhabiting, incarnating those who are persecuted. It's never just a nameless face, a number, an other, who you are harming. It's Jesus himself, the enfleshed God of love. This is something that Saul needs to confront. Maybe us too. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Conversion number two. Sometimes our eyes are opened and we still can't see a thing. Seeing is one thing, sight is another. Insight, understanding, comprehending the ripple effects, the ramifications, these all happen by degrees. These unfold. These will utterly change us. And so the men with Saul, who had heard the voice too, they take Saul by the hand and bring him to Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. We can be in the dark for quite a while, even with our eyes open. Something profound has shaken us to the core, but we have no idea what to do with it. We can't make out the shape of anything. Then the scene shifts to Ananias, a disciple in Damascus. The Lord came to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, here I am, Lord. Again, there's that calling of the name that goes straight to the heart that bids us to call back. The Lord said to him, and this gets really specific, get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, 
and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. That's shorthand for, oh, no, 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 Lord. Have you lost your mind? He's threatening us. He's throwing us in prison. He's killing us. He's the enemy. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Conversion number three. God can turn enemies into instruments of love and transformation. And sometimes it's only the transformed enemy who can be heard by others who have shared their perspective. This goes hand in hand with conversion number four. And someone has to take the risk to bridge to the enemy, to see in them the possibility for a different way. Someone has to let them out of the enemy box and allow that they just might be a brother or a sister. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the way has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Conversion number five. It takes the incarnational embodied act of another done in the name of the Lord to have the scales fall from our open eyes so that our sight, our true sight, sight from the perspective of Jesus can be restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the Son of God. Conversion number six. Conversion births new behavior. Scale-free eyes demand a change in our being. A continuation with a continuing formation with others in the way of love and a willingness to proclaim such love even at the risk that your former friends may now consider you an enemy because you discovered that your enemies are your brothers and sisters. Well, conversion is messy. Peter is also undergoing his own multiple and ongoing conversions. He has to be converted from the shame of his threefold denial to the life-giving, soul-restoring gift and opportunity of proclaiming his threefold love. He has to be converted from his love of these, his familiar go-to soul-soothing fishing, to the feeding and tending of Jesus' sheep and lambs. He has to be converted from setting his own direction to being taken to places he does not wish to go. And he has to be converted to this fundamental truth. Following Jesus always flows from loving Jesus and not the other way around. That gives us conversion 7, 8, 9, and 10. On this third Sunday of Easter, what in you needs to be converted? Is it a large, turn-your-world-upside-down type of conversion that you need? Or is it a small shift 
or expansion in perception, like turning from catching fish to tending those whom Jesus calls us to feed? Is it conversion in who you understand as enemy and who you understand as brother or sister? Is it a conversion in where you are called to stand? Not on one side, nor on the other, but is a bridge between the two. Is it a releasing of shame and a recommitting to love that's needed? Where are your eyes open and yet you are still not seeing a thing? Where are you sitting in the dark and by whom do you need to be touched for the scales to fall away and restore your sight? And what in your behavior will have to change once your sight is restored? What is the conversion that's needed in you, specific to the particular contours of your life, known only in the quiet spaces of your heart and your soul? Episcopalians aren't known for reeling off our conversion story. But that's the thing. It's never just one. What are your messy, ongoing, multifaceted, big, and small conversion stories? We all have them. How is Jesus calling your name? And how is your heart leaping in response? What call and response is Jesus doing with you? In the end, that's really what conversion is all about anyway. A call and response initiated in love, calling for love and return that so utterly changes us that all we can do is follow that love for the rest of our lives even to the places that we do not wish to go. When this love calls, say yes, even if it means doing a radical 180 like Saul, even if it means leaving the catch of your lives 153 fish like Peter. Let this process of conversion unfold in you over and over again until conversion is not just the air that you breathe but is also the love that you live.